this would all be bad enough if it wasn't for the finance minister, who I honestly don't know how she has her job. I'm, I, I'm sure she is liked in the caucus. I don't have anything personally against her, but she's clearly incompetent. I mean, you mean debate at the Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Madam Speaker, I want to speak this evening about the concept of the government's, or the government's assertion about tax fairness uh, in this budget. So I'd like to read into the record some, some facts that push back on the government's assertion that a fairly significant tax increase that they've included in this budget is only going to affect a very small number of Canadians. Um, I'm reading from an article in the National Post because when I was putting my notes together for the speech, I'm like, you know what, this, this actually summarizes it very well, so why reinvent the we uh, wheel? So um, this is an article written by Matthew Lau uh, last week. So in its latest announcement on the capital gains tax increase, the Liberal government presents as a quick, quick fact that it's increasing capital gains taxes on 0.13% of Canadians in any given year. There are three problems with the 0.13% figure. First, it's misleading. Second, it's incomplete. And third, it ignores tax incidence, which is a concept that the economic burden of tax falls on different people. In fact, on very many more people than those simply who face a higher tax bill. And that's something that people, that, that concept of tax incidence is something that I encourage colleagues to understand prior to continuing to vote in favour of this budget, because it, it, it will detrimentally impact the Canadian economy. Let's take these three problems in order. First, the 0.13% figure is misleading because of the phrase that follows, in any given year. The taxpayers who are, pay, who are part of this 0.13% in one year are different than the taxpayers captured in this group in another year. For many Canadians reporting an annual capital gain in excess of $250,000, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event, or immediately after lifetime event if the capital gain threshold is triggered when a deceased person's assets are liquidated. So what this is saying is that this affects families. This means that even if only 0.13% of Canadians pay this higher tax rate every year, a much greater percentage of Canadians will be hit with this tax hike over the course of their lives. Economists concluded that, as a share of Canada's tax filer population, those impacted by the new capital gains tax proposal on a lifetime basis is 1.26 million, or 4.3% of tax files, filers, compared to the budget estimate of 0.13%. Second, the 0.13% figure is incomplete because it excludes corporations. As Liberals es estimated in Budget 2024, approximately 307,000 corporations, again in a given year, will be subject to the tax. About 6,000 of those are likely to be publicly traded, so many Canadians will effectively be subject to higher tax capital tax gains through their investments and through their pensions assets, right? So that's something that the government doesn't talk about, is that, that how this tax increase is going to affect their investments and particularly pensions. And I, the government has not adequately costed that or talked about it in their presentation of this tax to, to Parliament and to the general public. Then there's the approximately 301,000 private corporations, many of whom have multiple owners, such as partners or family members, so even excluding exposure to publicly traded corporations, many Canadians will be hit by the capital gains tax through their investment. Overall, an economist estimates, 4.74 million investors in Canadian companies will be affected, representing 15.8% of all filers, or more than 100 times the Liberal stated figure of 0.13%. And again, I want to emphasize what I said in the earlier part of that statement, which is a lot of these are family members. These are family-owned corporations of tradespeople, and it's why the leader of the opposition asked the Liberals to provide an, a, a, an amendment saying, look, if it's only going to affect 0.13%, then accept an amendment to keep it to that. But we know that they can't, and that's why they won't accept this amendment, because they know these facts, and, and, and they're just not telling the Canadian public. They're not being honest. And that's not fair. But this brings us thirdly to the concept of tax incidence, of which students will learn in a good economics class 
but which the Liberal government would like us to all ignore. A well-known example, on paper, corporate income taxes are paid by shareholders, but in reality, the economic burden of the tax falls largely on workers in the form of lower wages. Corporate income taxes in discourage investment, thus reducing labour productivity and the number of businesses bidding for labour. No differently, the Liberal government's capital gains tax discourages business investment and will have negative effects on workers beyond those who earn high amounts of capital gains in any given year. Business investment has already, taken a, uh, um, has already fallen in an alarming fashion since the Liberals took office. From 2015 Q3 to 2024 Q1, the per capita, real per capita investment is down 13.9%. A capital gains tax hike that distorts investments decisions to favour present day consumption over long term investment will make this trend even worse. The incidence of the Liberals capital gains tax hike will fall on all of us, not just the 15.8% who are directly affected or the quote 0.13% of Canadians in any given year end quote that the Liberals claim. For ordinary Canadians, learning about tax incidents for two hours could be a profitable and amusing activity. Being whacked by a capital gains tax that the Liberals will say only affect the super rich, but affects all of us, not so much. The other point that's been made by economists and any business person is that the brisk implementation of the hike guarantees that it will enforce Canadian investors to shed assets in a hurry to take advantage of the existing lower rate but revenue will decline over time. So while we know that the Liberals are facing potential credit downgrades because of the incredible debt, amount of debt that they've incurred on the Canadian economy or on the Canadian people, and because of the incredible deficit they once again racked up this year, they're looking for a way to prevent that credit downgrade. So they're looking for an easy cash grab, right? I mean, you never want to be in a position as a person where you're looking for a quick way to make money. That's where poor decisions are made. And there are all sorts of crass examples I could give of that, right? But like, you know what, why wouldn't I do that? This is like the equivalent of feet selling pictures for the Liberals. That's what the capital gains tax is here. It's a quick cash grab to try and fix, prevent Canada from having its credit downgraded. Um, so I want to say this. This would all be bad enough if it wasn't for the finance minister, who I honestly don't know how she has her job. I'm, I, I'm sure she is liked in the caucus. I don't have anything personally against her, but she's clearly incompetent. I mean, how, I, how the Liberal backbench allowed her to present a budget that was this unbalanced, with this in it, and keep her job is, it's beyond me. Like, this is so irresponsible. So, but, but what she said, in announcing this, I thought, should give all colleagues in this place for pause for thought. Her comments, um, it, it, they were described as this in a major Canadian newspaper. The finance minister's remarks seem like naked class warfare in a miserably thin guise of technical fairness. Trying to, to tell the Canadian people who, th this government has spent, what, Bill, billions, billions and billions of dollars. Are we in trillions now? I, I, like, they've spent so much money. And I don't think there's a single Canadian who can look at their life in terms of being able to buy groceries, afford rent, look at buying a house, take a vacation, that, that long-term prosperity, and certainly not young Canadians. They're saying they're better off now than they were nine years ago. And so if, if we've spent all of this money, essentially in peacetime, like, like this is not pandemic time the last few years, right? This is not a, like, there's no reason for this deficit this year. If they've spent all this money in this short period of time and Canadians have nothing to show for it, then, then why are we still allowing this government to use spending as a metric? And when they say that, you know, they're creating tax fairness, but they're just increasing taxes to make life more unaffordable and create less investment for our country, we can't allow them as parliamentarians, we have to hold them to account on this. I understand that there are different schools of political thought in this place about what the government should spend on and what they shouldn't. But what we, none of us, regardless of political strife, should allow a government to do is to spend without outcome. And that is, a, that is exactly what this government has done. You know, when you think about all of the waste, all of the, all of the waste, we've only scratched the, the tip of the iceberg on the scandal of their waste. 
we should never be listening to this government about trying to take more of Canadians' hard-earned money to let it go into the abyss. We have to stop it. So I implore colleagues of all political stripe to vote against this budget. It is bad. They need to go back to the drawing board. And certainly this measure that they've put in there is not tax fairness. It's decimation for the Canadian people. Thank you. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Gales. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, I think uh, the uh, Honourable Member's comments uh, gives rise to that old uh, quote that, you know, you can put all the accountants end to end and they'll never reach a conclusion. Um, and I wanted to quote a few things from the International Monetary Fund. And, uh, and get the Honourable Member's reaction to that. It says, Canada's fiscal track record continues to compare favourably to many other advanced economies. Debt remains low in international comparison. And says, the increase in capital gains inclusion rate improves the tax system's neutrality with respect to different forms of capital income and is likely to have no significant impact on investment or productivity growth. Um, that doesn't suggest that uh, things are going to go to hell in a handbasket. I'm just wondering if uh, what the Honourable Member has read and what I've just mentioned, if, if there's some kind of disconnect that she could explain. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. I, I would argue humbly that he is disconnected. If he goes and knocks on the doors in his riding, mm -hmm. there is nobody who is going to accept what he just said, because the lived reality of Canadians is not one of prosperity. It's one of hardship right now, and it's one of lack of the hope for the future. So that, that's what disconnect looks like. But also there's so many other metrics where he's just flat out wrong. Um, Canada's on its, a track for its worst decline in living standards in 40 years. Uh, before the current Prime Minister, Canada's GDP grew at a rate similar to that of the United States. But since 2015, the economy is weakened. Um, uh, significantly, um, Canada's uh, GDP per capita is down 2%, while the United States has increased by 8%. I could go on and on, but like, I don't need to quote this plethora of economic statistics which, which validate my point. I just have to go door knock in my writing. Yeah. That's all I have to do. And I encourage him to do the same, because I think he's going to find that he's, he's in for a reckoning come the next election. Yeah, yeah.